Good evening. This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, December 5th, 2023. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Lichter. We will then have a moment of silence. No, nobody was nodding. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the December 5th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any additions or changes to this evening's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons, to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is the election of board officers. And at this time, I will turn the meeting over to Dr. Rogers. Thank you. As required by Section 3.2B09 of the Education Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland and Board Policy 8210, the first meeting in December is designated for election of the board chair and vice chair. According to Board Policy 8210, the superintendent presides over the election for offices of chair. Nominations are now open for the office of board chair. Are there any nominations? Ms. Frempong? I nominate Ms. Booker Dwyer. Ms. Booker Dwyer is nominated. Are there further nominations for the office of board chair? Hearing none. Nominations are now closed. The Education Transparency Act requires that any action of the Baltimore County Board be required, I'm sorry, be recorded by voice vote or roll call vote. Ms. Gover, please call the roll for those voting for Ms. Booker Dwyer for the Office of Board Chair. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Dolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. It's unanimous. Congratulations. <laughs> Ms. Booker Dwyer has been elected as chair of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for the 2023-2024 school year. Please join me in giving her a round of applause. <laughs> As the board chair's transition, we also, on behalf of Baltimore County Public Schools, wants to uh, congratulate and thank outgoing chair Jane Lichter for her services during the school year. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Hi. So thank you all for your nomination. I definitely appreciate it. And um, I'm honored to serve Baltimore County as chair of the Board of Education. This moment is not lost on me. Um, 
my great grandmother cleaned Baltimore County schools. My grandmother cleaned Baltimore County schools. And my mother cleaned Baltimore County schools. I didn't think I was going to get emotional. So this moment is not lost on me. Baltimore County runs deep in my family, and I'm honored to be chair. So thank you all for your nominations, for your support, and your votes. Thank you. OK, on to the vice chair. <laughs> nominations are now in order for the office of the board vice chair. Are there any nominations? I nominate Christina Pumphrey. Ms. Pumphrey, the chair recognizes Ms. Savoy in nominating Ms. Pumphrey. Are there further nominations for the office of board vice chair? Without objection, nominations are closed. All those who vote for Ms. Pumphrey as vice chair will do a roll call vote. Um, so all those who vote for Ms. Pumphrey as vice chair, please say yes when the roll is called. All those opposed, please say no. Ms. Gover, please call the roll. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. So Ms. Pumphrey has received all the votes are unanimous. I am pleased to announce that Ms. Pumphrey has been elected as vice chair of the Board of Education for Baltimore County for 2023-2024. I want to thank Ms. Harvey for her service as vice chair. And, and um, Ms. Pumphrey, you can take your seat. I, too, echo the sentiments of Chair Booker Dwyer. I want to thank Ms. Harvey for her hard work and her partnership as chair, vice chair of the board for this past school year. Congratulations. And thank you. And Ms. Also want to welcome Ms. Pumphrey as vice chair of the board. Thank you. As you all may know, I'm not quite as articulate <laughs> as Ms. Booker DeWire, but I, I am humbled for my nomination and for all of your support, and I am excited to serve BCPS further. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. I would be first. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and to members of the board. I like the board's consent for the following personnel matters retirements, resignations, leaves, and certificate appointments. Do I have a motion to approve personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 through E4? So moved, Frimpong. Do I have a second? Second, Savoy. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vo vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Frimpong? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. 
The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended the following safety and security protocols. Participants should be seated in the room during meetings. Individuals who need to stand should go into the hallway to do so. Participants should not approach the table unless called upon to speak and should not approach the DS. Materials brought to the table are limited to electronic devices, presentation papers, and posters no larger than 11 by 14 inches. Other items should be left in your seat. Documents to be given to the board are to be handed to the staff member who is seated in the front area of the meeting space. Information for other attendees is to be left on the designated table outside in the hall. In the event of an emergency that requires an emergency response, such as a lockout, lockdown, or, eva or evacuation, staff from the Office of School Safety will direct participants. While we encourage the public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper form to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Disparaging remarks or, de or derogatory remarks towards students and staff will not be tolerated. Inappropriate personnel remarks or other behaviors that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using language that are threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Person who otherwise disrupt or disturb the meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific students or employee matters or commenting on matters not related to the public education in Baltimore County. That is a lot to read. <laughs> It is the practice of the board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board first, um, but we have no elected officials, so we will move on. Um, we have no school system affiliated groups, so um, we will move on to our unions. So our first speaker is Mr. Billy Burke um, with CASE. Congratulations, Ms. Booker Dwyer, Ms. Pumphrey on your appointments. I look forward to meeting you and working with you. Good evening, Chairwoman, Ms. Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair, Ms. Pumphrey, Superintendent, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Thank you for letting me speak on behalf of CASE. This season of negotiations has been productive. BCPS and CASE have both presented changes to the master agreement that I believe support and improve hiring and retention efforts. The decisions around compensation now rest in the hands of the board, the county executive, and ultimately the county council. I trust that BCPS is working closely with the county and is creating a budget aligned with county expectations. I have been critical in the past of negotiations and the budget process. In the past, the process has not been transparent as to the collaboration with the county. I am hopeful we are moving in the right direction, but communication with you as the board has been limited and communication with the county has been non-existent. As you finalize the budget proposal, please make every effort to fund step increases for case members and to add additional steps to the salary scale to ensure competitiveness with the surrounding counties and private schools. Please fund the cost of living adjustments with inflation at 3.2%, a simple loan or food or house supplies have become expenses that most families struggle with. A cost of living adjustment that reacts to the current rate of inflation is a clear sign to staff that they are valued. Please make every effort to appropriately fund special education. To best serve the students of BCPS, we need IEP facilitators, additional special education teachers and service providers, department chairmen, paraeducators, bus attendants, and central office resource teachers, specialists, and supervisors. Please make every effort to appropriately fund ESOL. When we strengthen the supports for our newest community members and ensure they have the resources to grow and contribute, we improve our whole community. The resources and strategies that improve special education services and ESOL services can be used with all children and improve school for all children. Thank you for your time and dedication to Baltimore County. Happy holidays to you and yours. I appreciate you and the opportunity to speak on behalf of CASE. Thank you, Mr. Burke. 
Our next speaker is Ms. Cindy Sexton from TABCO. Good evening. I keep changing up these names. Good evening, <laughs> Dr. Rogers, Chair Ms. Booker Dreyer, Vice Chair Ms. Pumphrey. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, all members of the board. Congratulations on your election. I look forward to working with you and the rest of the board as we continue on the work of recruiting and retaining educators and meeting the needs of our students and staff. And to our outgoing ones, thank you for all you did, the collaborations and the conversations, and I'm sure those will continue as well. I want to thank the school system. Dr. Rogers, you worked with TABCO and we made it happen. Our negotiations were completed by the November 30th date. Thank you for your commitment to that timeline and thank you to your team and the TABCO negotiations team for all the time and effort in reaching those tentative agreements. I look forward to taking them to the TABCO board, the TABCO representative assembly, and then the full membership for ratification in January. None of us can ever remember it being done this early. We worked together and we got it done. Thank you to all those who were part of the process. I'm not certain I will be at the next board meeting, and I know you all miss me hearing talking about recruiting and retaining, but I've been invited to an event at Hebville Elementary, and I'm going to be there. So I want to take this time to wish everyone a peaceful and restful holiday season. Thank you to everyone who works with and for our students in any capacity every single day. I appreciate you. Have a good night. Thank you, Ms. Sexton. Next are the nonprofit community groups. And our first speaker is Mr. Greg Ackerman from PFLAG. Hello, Mr. Ackerman. Is it, did I, am I pronouncing it's, your name right? It's Greg Ackerman. Ackerman. Yeah, good evening. Thank you so much uh, for uh, including me tonight. Uh, my name is Greg Ackerman. I'm a parent of two BCPS students. My older child is transgender, a member of the LGBTQ plus community. My wife, my family, and I are proud members of PFLAG, an organization that supports uh, members of the LGBTQ plus community, their families, and their friends. Today, I express my wholehearted support for continuing the inclusive education of our youth on topics of race, ethnicity, and LGBTQ plus topics, and here are reasons why. All students have a First Amendment right to read and learn about the history and viewpoints of all communities, including their own. The First Amendment protects educators' and students' rights to receive and exchange information and knowledge. Freedom of expression protects our right to read, learn, and share ideas from viewpoint-based censorship. Book bans, classroom censorship are misguided attempts to suppress our rights. They erase the history and lived experiences of women, people of color, and LGBTQ plus people. Every student has the right to receive an equitable education with open and honest dialogue about US history. Yes, we can love our country and still acknowledge past failures with the goal to make things better today and for the future. According to American Psychological Association research, students gain benefits from an inclusive curriculum, including positive changes in students' attitudes and values, improved critical thinking skills, even higher overall achievement levels for both majority and, major and, and minority group students. And lastly, positive diversity experiences lead to greater interest in improving the lives of others in their communities. Education also prepares children for the workplace. According to recent studies from Indeed and Glassdoor, two of the largest hiring platforms, there are three important takeaways. The number of employers adding diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, DEI, is increasing, not decreasing. 62% of US workers said they would consider declining a job offer or leaving a company if, the, if that manager did, did not support DEI values. And also, 74% of US workers said that corporate investment in DEI is either very important or at least somewhat important in their decision to accept or keep a job. Working su successfully with people is a life skill. I want all of our children to gain this valuable life skill so that they can thrive as working adults. To close, it's about courtesy and respect for people of all backgrounds. All are welcome. Listening and understanding brings us together and makes us stronger as a community and a country. 
I appreciate the work you all do. Uh, thank you very much for listening and for the opportunity tonight. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Next are our individual citizens and student groups. Our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening. I first want to say congratulations to Ms. Booker Dwyer and Ms. Pumphrey. I think that the board made an excellent choice as far as uh, the new chair and vice chair. Um, I'm going to, I'm speaking low because I have a cold. So I'm here tonight um, to emphasize the word communication because communication matters. And what I'm seeing as far as special education is concerned is that communication doesn't matter. And I'll explain why. Um, in 2012, there was a headline on, an, on psychology today that said the devastating diagnosis of autism. I wonder what people here think of when they hear the word devastating. As the mother of a child with autism, my child is anything but devastating. So when I see that, that is very upsetting to me. Last night at a CCAC meeting, I heard that IEP chairs are being cautioned about putting a child in a more restrictive environment because it could be dangerous to them. Again, what do you think of when you think of danger or dangerous? Is a more restrictive environment or a least restrictive environment dangerous to a particular child? Yes, it can be, but on the same token, not putting that child in the correct placement can be more dangerous. We have to be cautious about the words we use when talking about special education. Special education has enough of a stigma. The other reason I bring up communication is because homeschool communication is something that's put in an IEP quite frequently. It's not being followed. I can't tell you how many times this school year I have heard from my clients and from parents in general that homeschool communication is not being followed, that they have no idea what's going on in that classroom until there's an injury or a really big problem. We need to fix that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Anna Weisenberg. Good evening, Chairwoman Booker Dwyer, members of the board. My name is Anna Weisberg and I'm a BCPS teacher. First of all, thank you for supporting the efficient negotiations for the terms of TAPCO's tentative agreement. I am grateful. I am also a participant in the Baltimore County Education Justice Table, the BCEJT, a large and growing coalition of educators, parents, and organizations from across the county working to advance equity and justice in public education for all students so they thrive in the classroom and in our local communities. We know that student achievement gaps are the result of historic and ongoing systemic inequities in our society. That's why the Blueprint for Maryland's Future mandates the implementation of the community schools here in Baltimore County. We appreciate tonight's presentation that's coming up and we are more than hopeful about the transformation that the community school model will bring to our schools and communities. Over the past three years though, our coalition has found that many stakeholders at the identified community schools 
have not been educated about the transformational community schools model, what that model could mean for their community or how they could help. Meanwhile, the achievement gap persists. We can do better. We want to take this public opportunity to explicitly point out that in addition to what the blueprint mandates, truly effective community schools require full staffing of high quality educators, providing high quality instruction and services, especially of special education, English language learner, and mental health practitioners. I hope BCPS will commit to the transformational community schools model. I hope we will seek full staffing of high quality educators in these high need areas, since we know that this is essential to seeing the gains our students and our communities need. Implementation, implementing transformational community schools isn't an effort that can be contract, contracted out or simply wrapped around. Community school implementation is an all hands on deck effort that will require deep community involvement, collaboration and long term investment. We look forward to collaborating with BCPS for the long term to ensure its success. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Erica Ma. Good evening, members of the Board of Education, and congratulations to our new chair and vice chair, and thank you very much to our former chair and vice chair for their work this past year. My name is Erica Ma, and I've been coming to the Board of Ed to speak for nearly 15 years, first as a BCPS parent, and then adding on my teacher hat. It's been interesting watching the BOE change and develop into the current hybrid board, and I'm very grateful for the current hybrid board that we have now. Previously, there were board members who very purposely looked down when I came up to speak, making it clear that they did not care one bit about what the stakeholders had to say. But over the past, past, uh, over the past decade, this has changed drastically to a board that has paid attention and strives to make our schools better. So I'm here today to say thank you. Thank you to the Board of Education, and especially thank you to Dr. Rogers, who promised to listen and has made various opportunities for us to be heard throughout the county. Thank you for listening to us and for having the most efficient and transparent bargaining process with TAPCO that many of us can remember. It's not perfect, but it's done in a timely manner and before the county fiscal process. It's a relief to not be wandering into June, as we did last year, what our pay would be for next year. With two children in college next year, I really need to know what my pay is going to be. And even with the efficient timeline, the contract has real changes that will help to recruit and retain teachers that which our students so desperately need. I was planning on coming here to only give a thank you, but I'm sorry I can't do just that. I'm not a psychologist, but anyone in the classroom can tell you that our children are in desperate need right now. Whether it be from COVID, what is going on in our world, or just individual and personal situations, there's more need than ever for us to build strong relationships with our students and to give them support. Students are screaming for love, support, and reassurance, and many are literally screaming, kicking, biting, hitting. I hope this contract and future planning and strategies will help to address the need for consistent and experienced staff supported by in-person mental health professionals, as well as strong administrations able to enforce BCPS policies and rules. We teachers love our students and want to do right by them, but there is only so much disruption, disrespect, and sometimes physical harm that teachers can tolerate before that love can't be enough. Thank you for your support of our teachers and our students, and I wish everybody a happy holiday. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferron. Good evening to all. Thank you for a wise choice for all of you. Thank you, Ms. Lichter, I will miss you. And thank you, Ms. Robin Harvey. Um, I think a couple of meetings ago, Mr. McMillian proposed at the end of the meeting, and I heard him while I'm listening into my ear pods out, he proposed about uh, for you, the board, to consider uh, the calendar. I have been a member since 1995 or so. The calendar basically functions the same way. Slight changes here and there. Too many holidays, too many perks here and there. I really think this is an important idea and I thank you, Mr. McMillian, for that proposal. I hope you take that in consideration 
you, the board, are the boss, not the other way around. I think you need to assess uh, that calendar and make it effective for education. Police department doesn't have as many holidays, FBI, GBMC, St. Joseph, etc. Second thing, I want to applaud Ms. Hen for, I think, the last meeting or maybe the meeting before, um, considering Spanish teachers. Um, and I agree, there are many Spanish people here. However, you know, the board is basically two colors and two religions, minus plus. Um, I've never really seen the school system employ in any of the meeting an Arab American teacher or a Muslim American teacher. And our numbers are really large in nature. Um, I don't think really we should advocate for one ethnicity. Um, I think we should look at all of us. Last but not least, in the last budget meeting, I noticed that 14% only uh, is contributed by the federal government. 14% only, and the rest is the county and state. In my time in the 90s, I think it used to be 40% from federal government. So what I'm saying to you, I suggest to you to advocate to our congressmen and senators to stop wasting our money sending it overseas to bomb and kill people. It cost five and a half trillion dollar, Iraq and Afghanistan. And we didn't win in either one. We didn't win in Vietnam either. You know how many schools we can build with five trillion dollars? How many teachers we can make happy? How many special education we can take care of them with equipment? How many laptops, computers, are Thank you. Thank you. Since there are speaker spaces available, we will now call from the wait list for individual citizens and student category. The first wait list speaker is Mr. Eric Morris. Good evening, board members. Uh, I'm Eric Morris, a proud BCPS employee, but today I am again here to speak to you about the need for strong policies supporting LGBTQ plus students of all ages, like, my two, like two of my three children. At recent board meetings, I have spoken to the great supports that my children's high school offers them, my transgender kids. They do this because they care about students and they care about their LGBTQ students. These are students who live every day, uh, live their lives every day in fear to, to be their true selves and fearful of those hate groups persecuting them. Moms for Liberty, one of those hate groups, along with other groups like PASS, are making statements that our trans, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, making statements that our trans students are creating unsafe environments for their children, when in fact those groups are the perpetrators of fear. And they are creating the unsafe environment for our children. And they also preach book banning for those books that support those LGBTQ students. I call Moms for Liberty a hate group, again, because for the, the foremost authority on identifying these groups, the Southern Poverty Law Center has added them to their hate group lists. Please, I beg you not to listen to these words of hate, lies, and division these groups are spewing. And listen to the words of love, compassion, and equity from groups like the ACLU, NAACP, PFLAG, GLSEN, your very own Teachers Union, and your very own BCPS Department of Social Emotional Supports. In their mission statements, they say that BCPS must provide equitable access to impactful services and programs that promote students' academic, behavioral, social, emotional, and physical development in preparation for college, career, and life readiness. With this mission statement in mind, I once again ask you, the board, the elected officials, the leaders of BCPS to reread the BCPS LGBTQ plus guidelines and call for a vote to make those guidelines district policies or rules. Or, be, or better yet, put together a special committee to plan a new inclusive, inclusivity policy. A committee made of teachers and staff, administration and parents, and students, 
and these outside LGBTQ plus um, expert organizations to put, to put together the best policies to protect our LGBTQ plus children. As I've not visibly seen any steps taken in that direction to this point, I would love to have the opportunity to speak to any one of you um, to discuss this vital need to support our LGBTQ children. Thank you for your time and support for our students, for all of our students. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Good evening, board chair, Booker Dwyer, vice chair Pumphrey, all members of the board. I am pleased to present the December superintendent's report. Next slide, please. As everyone knows by now, budget season in Baltimore County Public Schools is well underway. Uh, again, we remind everyone that you can refer to our website where you can find Budget 101 that really works to unpack how our budget is created, our revenue sources, as well as our spending. All year long, we work with offices, schools, leaders, and stakeholders to really provide, this year, we to really provide uh, information regarding our budget development process and also to seek input and feedback uh, regarding our next steps as we plan for FY25. We have noted challenges for this upcoming budget, including the ESSER fiscal cliff for all school systems across the nation, uh, blueprint mandates, as well as opportunities for, or needs for additional saving. Opportunities for the community to provide feedback have included surveys, community forums, uh, area council meetings, upcoming public hearings, and of course, Budget 101 website. This evening, I would like to share with you specific information from the principal budget priority survey, as well as the stakeholder uh, across Team BCPS, their responses as well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll begin with the principal budget priority survey. Um, as you can see, we had representation of all types of schools. Our elementary schools, middle school, high school, and special schools and centers were represented. When asked to rank the four priority areas that we've identified for BCPS, all of our principals, identified, or the first choice was academic achievement, followed by safety and climate, recruitment and retention with infrastructure as the last priority. Next slide, please. We asked principals to identify whether or not uh, they wanted us as we develop the school budget for the school system to focus on examining opportunities for improvement, balancing programs and opportunities, or um, preserving programs as much as possible. Overwhelming majority, 70%, asked that we examine opportunities for improvement as we move forward and recruitment and retention of our high-performing workforce as we move forward with the development of the budget. Additionally, we asked them to rank budget priorities of note all of our school leaders, the top area was professional development, making sure that our educators were well trained, followed by social emotional behavioral health and safety of students, with the third item being teacher student ratio. Next slide, please. When we asked principals overall uh, for a budget focus to identify and rank uh, in from one to seven, what was the most important? Hiring and retaining high quality staff, ranked number one, followed a close second, was providing academic support services to students that need it the most, and keeping the class sizes small. Again, really focusing on that teacher to student ratio. Next slide. We asked our principals to also share with us the top five additional school-based resources that if there was room in the budget to make uh, additional expenditures, what would they like us to focus on? 
Uh, the top two, uh, they were tied at 49 responses, were additional teachers and staff development teachers for that job embedded professional development, followed by school-based math resource teachers specifically, and special education teachers, and the fifth need, fifth request, was assistant principal. Next slide, at this time, we'll transition over to the stakeholder budget priority survey where we received responses from several thousand um, responses across Team BCPS. You'll note the first donut um, graph shows you the distribution. We had staff, students, uh, parents, guardians, community members all participate in this survey. Their ranking of the four priority areas was a little different than the principals. They identified the top priority as recruitment and retention of staff, followed by safety and climate, and then academic achievement and infrastructure. Next slide, please. The top priority for our stakeholders was to examine opportunities for progress specifically focused on recruitment and retention of our high-performing workforce, followed by balancing preservation and opportunities and then preserving programs. When our stakeholders overall outside of our school leaders were asked to rank the school system budget priorities, the first one was teacher-student ratio. The number of students in a classroom was extremely important. They also felt that social emotional behavioral health of students was the second need, and the third one was instructional materials. Next slide, please. Their overall recommendations for the budget in terms of focus area was first hiring and retaining high quality staff, followed by academic support. I'm sorry, followed by keeping the class sizes small, and then academic support services to the students in need. Next slide, please. When we took a look at the responses from our stakeholders, as well as the responses from our leaders, we noted some similarities. The number one overall priority was hiring and retaining high quality staff in all groups, as we agree as well as a school system. Safety and climate or focus area number two identified, as well as examining opportunities to improve um, being the number one focus overall for the budget. Uh, in the top three for both groups was uh, making sure that the FY25 provided academic support services to students in needs. Differences included academic achievement being the number one priority for school leaders compared to the teacher-student ratio for families and external stakeholders. One might argue that um, it is believed that a, a smaller teacher-student ratio will help uh, to advance the goals of academic achievement. And another key uh, difference was around professional development. Professional development was identified as the number one system priority by school leaders um, for a budget strategy in terms of next steps that were needed to move the work further. Next slide, please. And so more information to come on our budget. We're very excited to put together all of the uh, feedback that we received from our stakeholders, um, whether it was from community conversations, from surveys, from individual um, meetings, and, and look forward to sharing that information in January. This time, we want to um, recognize that th we are now in the season of giving. As a school system, we are working in three different areas and wanted to share that with the greater Baltimore County community. Uh, we are again partnering with the Baltimore County uh, Education Foundation to share the warmth um, to meet the needs of our students and uh, children in need across Baltimore County Public Schools. We are also working with Kids Helping Kids, which is the Children's Hospital uh, Center at Johns Hopkins, where many of our students um, from birth through 12th grade um, and children of our staff members have been um, helped tremendously 
by the Hopkins Children Hospital. And so schools are working to identify, um, you know, volunteering to identify individual projects. And so if you are interested in uh, lending your efforts, uh, please reach out to your school. Um, if your school is not participating, please reach out to um, central office and we'll be able to help point you to a school that is participating in uh, raising funds uh, specifically from students to help other children. And lastly, um, our human resources uh, division is spearheading, again, um, giving trees where we are adopting three families across three families in Baltimore County Public Schools that have six children. And so we are donating items for those students and their families. And we want to uh, encourage everyone to join us um, or simply uh, send uh, good wishes uh, their way and want to move to the next slide, please. Want to again thank you for all of your time and hope uh, this information was helpful as we move further into the budget process and as we think about all of the reasons that we have to be thankful for and all of our students uh, and families that are in need uh, during this time of year. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Rogers. So the next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Well, no, is the chair's report. And so for um, the chair's report, um, we have a new chair and a new vice chair. Um, so that is the extent of the report for, um, <laughs> for this evening. Uh, we will have, <laughs> thank you. We will have a more robust report at the next board meeting. So now we will move to um, the next item on the agenda is unfinished business. Oh no, student member of the board. Sorry about that, Ms. Drummond. So the next agenda item is the student board members report. And for that, I call on Ms. Drummond. Good evening, everyone. Um, I first wanted to say that I just celebrated my 18th birthday last week. Um, it's definitely been, <laughs> thank you. It's definitely been a very interesting but rewarding year. Um, my second town hall will be this Thursday, December 7th at 6 p.m. using the Google Meets code SMOB Town Hall, all capitals, no spaces. Um, secondly, the student member of the board application for the 2024-2025 school year is now open through January 8th. Um, the application includes an essay, a resume, and five letters of recommendation. That is all of my announcement. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, consideration of board policies. This is the second reader for these policies, and for that I call on Ms. Christina Pumphrey, Chair of the Policy Review Committee. Thank you. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policy. Board Policy 3150, Board Insurance Program, Board Policy 3310, Food and Nutrition Services, Board Policy 3330, Food Service Finance, and Board Policy 5150, Resident and Non-Resident Student Eligibility. These policies are, pre policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit J1 through J4. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 3150, 3310, 3330, and 5150? So moved. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Okay. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Tomanowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Jaluski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Nope. Yes, motion carries. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of the watershed public charter school renewal. And for that, I call on Dr. Jones, Dr. DiDonato, and Dr. Elmendorf.
Hello. Good evening. Hello. <clears throat> so at the last board meeting, we shared the findings of the renewal review team. And after considering the recommendation of the re uh, renewal review team, the Baltimore County Public Schools Superintendent, Dr. Rogers, um, recommended that the uh, contract with Watershed Public Charter School Incorporated uh, to operate Watershed Public Charter School be renewed for a five-year term running from July 1st, 2024 to June 30th, 2029. And I want to um, recognize that we have some Watershed staff here today, if they would stand up. This time I will turn it over to the board for action. May I have a motion to approve the renewal of the Watershed Public Charter School? So, so moved. Humphrey. <laughs> Second. Back in Savoy. Second. Okay. That's good. Is there, are there, is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Burns. Madam Chair, there are no uh, legal items in closed session. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards. And for that, I call on Mr. Young, Vice Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met on Monday, December 4th, 2023, Items M1 through M4 and M7 through M16 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Items M5 and M6 are being forwarded to the full board without a recommendation. Do I have a motion to approve items M1 through M4 and M7 through M16? So moved. No second, no second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? This is an easy board meeting today. May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Mm -hmm. Do I have a motion to approve items M5 and M6? So moved. Is there a second? Second, Lichter. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ms. Dominowski. I just had a quick question. Uh, what is the, the reasoning behind these not being recommended by the committee? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Young. Ms. Dominowski, based upon the committee having four members and only three being present, we would have needed all three members to um, vote to move these forward. I recuse myself from those two contracts. Okay, thank you. Okay, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Recuse. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Stolesky? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? <coughs> yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is new business special project request. And for that, I call on Dr. Jones and Ms. Reed. And this is Principal DeLong, welcome. Good evening. I'm actually not joined by Ms. Reed, but I am joined by um, Ms. Delone, who is very passionate about the, um, is about the project. So for board approval, we do have a special project request, which has been submitted for repairs and upgrades for the greenhouse located at Hereford Middle School. Um, there are several repairs that will bring the greenhouse up to speed, including a new swamp cooler, cleaning of sumps, and refilling with water, replacement of filter panels of the remaining units, installation of new belts, and cleaning of the exterior units. Um, 
we're, we're happy to say that this request is funded by a grant through the Maryland Agricultural Resource Council to replace equipment and for repairs to Hereford Middle School's greenhouse. Funds were paid by My Neighbors Foundation, and this project would benefit, again, the students located at Hereford Middle School and the school science and agri-science agri courses. Thank you. Okay, may I have a motion to approve the privately funded capital project for greenhouse repairs at Hereford Middle School? So move Stolowski. Second, Hen. Any discussion? Okay, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Frempaw? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Drummond? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your support for our agri-science uh, department. It also benefits Hereford High School uh, for the computer, the, the completer pathways for graduation. So thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on Blueprint Pillar 4, more resources for students to be successful. And for that, I call on Dr. DiDonato, Dr. Jones, Ms. Forrester, and Ms. Stansbury. Dr. Rogers is going to start us off. Yes, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, we are missing a slide, but we're going to do uh, the introduction anyway. Um, so uh, it, it, it is perfect timing that we had a uh, community member come and speak uh, to community schools. Uh, this pillar, we are especially excited around the work that's happening in Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, around community schools. For uh, those who don't have uh, as much familiar, familiarity with community schools, it's an evidence-based strategy um, that really focuses on the whole child. It's really where the school comes together with the community and external partners um, to provide wraparound services to the student uh, to really ensure that we're addressing um, any gaps that may exist and that we're really thinking about the full uh, the full family. When we talk about wraparound services, uh, we are talking about before and after care. We're talking about mentorship programs. We're talking about uh, health and wellness centers, uh, social workers, school psychologists, counselors, um, restorative practice coaches, and more. Uh, the team that has is assembled in front of you is going to do a uh, pretty good uh, dive into Pillar 4, what those requirements are, where we are as a school system. Uh, we are in year five, specifically with uh, community schools, where currently we have um, 56 community schools at different phases of the process, and we're looking forward to next year being uh, having more than 75 schools. Um, and so we're really excited about how we ensure that targeted supports are based on needs and they are matched with the students who need additional resources and families and that um, you know we're, we're really taking next steps with our concentration of uh, poverty grant. Uh, so this team will talk to you about how we really are going to tend to the physical, uh, mental health needs, academic needs, and the extracurricular needs of all of our students um, as a part of Pillar 4. And so at this time, I turn it over to Dr. Di Donato. Thank you. Thank you. The focus of Pillar I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. The focus of Pillar 4 is truly to provide more resources to ensure student success. Looking at students who are receiving um, special education services, our English language learners, our students who are um, living in high concentration of poverty areas, um, and supporting students in the area of behavior health. The pillar uh, components of English language learners and special education are entwined within the other pillars. You've heard us talk about the academic achievement and success, both with having students um, uh, available and 
programs available for students in pre-K. We heard that in Pillar 1 and that students who require special education services or who are identified as potential L's are automatically qualified for pre-kindergarten programs. So the more resources for students, for students specifically with special education services or ESOL services are really entwined within the other um, pillars. However, it's acknowledged in this pillar because there's work groups that were formed as part of the efforts to look at um, what are some recommendations based on current research models in other states and around um, the country for best practices for English language learners as well as for students receiving special education services. The work group did put out a final report for um, the ESOL work group um, that includes multiple recommendations as far as instructional programming, services and supports, providing resources and supports to families, which you'll see tie into some of our community school work. The special education work group has been formed. Um, it is at the state level and is still in process. Um, they anticipated a preliminary inter uh, session report sometime in November, which um, has not occurred at this point. Um, however, their final report is supposed to happen over the summer. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to my partners. Thank Next slide. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear us clearly. So thank you for giving us an opportunity to talk about what we're most excited about, and that's <laughs> community schools. Melissa and I have been very passionate about this. Um, you may be wondering what makes a community school different from any other school, and it's simply the fact that the school and the community are one. It's really about providing the supports to students, families, and community members to be successful. Because while we have students here in our buildings every day, five days a week, they do go home to their families. And when they go home, they need the support they need to be successful to return back to us. So what you see on this slide is really an example of how to implement the community school initiative using a multi-year approach. Year one is really dedicated to needs assessment. What are the needs of the students, the families, and the community itself in order to make sure that we are supporting everyone specifically with what they need versus what we believe that they need? And that includes involving stakeholders. Every community school has a shared decision-making team. That shared decision-making team includes students, families, community members, and community partners. And so we've been very fortunate to have true advocates through TAPGO, as they are very passionate also about the community school initiative, and we've partnered with them. We um, meet with them regularly. They have their own group. We kind of share information with each other because this is not an initiative that we have ever thought we can do independent of our stakeholders. And all of our stakeholders include not just community partners, but also those partners that are partners with BCPS. Year two really goes into, now that we've identified what the needs are in the community and for students, what are the root causes of those needs? And let's develop a multi-year plan to address those needs, starting with the priorities that come out of the needs assessment. In year three, it's full implementation. We've spent two years investing and determining what needs to happen and how we're gonna execute those pieces. And now it's time to execute, collect data, and refine practices in order to make sure we're meeting everyone where they are. We have grown very quickly when it comes to community schools over the past five years. We started with four schools in year one, 10 schools in year two. By year three, we had 22. Year four, we were at 36. Year five, we are at 56. And we are projecting to add the most number of schools um, that we have thus far, and that's 23 additional schools to be well over 75, as Dr. Rogers shared. Um, we don't have official data yet because that comes from MSDE late January, early February, but this is our projection. So as we think about this, almost half of our schools in the system will be community schools. Every school can be a community school. You don't have to have the funding to be a community school. You simply need to have the passion about creating partnerships with stakeholders and families. And we can do that in every school. So community schooling can be a way of schooling in BCPS for everyone. Mm -hmm. Melissa? Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Michelle, I'm gonna move to this one, sorry. Um, Michelle talks a little bit about the needs assessment, but that's really a big component, component of Blueprint is um, our comprehensive needs assessment, and it is very encompassing. We actually have five components. Um, they include the asset inventory, the existing data review, where we really analyze the data of the school, um, key informant interviews, listening sessions, like Michelle said, with all stakeholders. This includes staff, students, partners, community members that may just reside in the area but don't necessarily have a student in that school. They're still a main component of the school. And then, of course, partners. And then we also have a survey that we give. We utilize the BCPS stakeholder survey as a key component in our needs assessment. And what you'll see here is our community school roadmap. Um, this is created through our BCPS Stakeholder Steering Committee, um, which we have our own, we call it a shared decision-making team at the school level. At the system level, we call it our BCPS Stakeholder Steering Committee um, for community schools, which encompasses students, staff, we have TAPCO representatives, we have community school facilitators, partners. They really helped us develop what we call a roadmap, and this is what guides community schools. This is how we evaluate our effectiveness, and we're really embedded in the five commitments that you see on the screen. Our needs assessment is embedded in this, and our implementation plan. Um, next slide, please. This is just a blow up. It's really blurry to see, um, but we live and breathe this roadmap. Um, we did this in collaboration with the Y in Central Maryland to create this and our stakeholder steering committee. All of our implementation plans, after the needs assessment, we have to identify key priorities, as Michelle said, and they all have to live in these evidence-based strategies. And then we measure them through our evidence-based impacts, whether that be chronic absenteeism, full day, full day attendance, number of enrichment partners, whatever that may be. Um, and we have an evaluator, an external evaluator, that shows us the effectiveness of this roadmap and whether we're meeting the needs of our stakeholders. Next slide, please. So I really hope that when you leave today, this triangle is kind of <laughs> what you remember the most about this discussion. Because the work of community schools lives in where you see the edges of the triangle. It's really making those connections to what's happening in school, to what's happening outside of the school day, and what's happening in the community. If we're living only along the sides of those tri of the triangle, we will only get but so far. We have to make those connections. And so community school work is really about connecting all of the dots, making sure that when we have out of school time programs, what's happening in those programs connects back to what's happening in the classroom mm -hmm. and not in isolation of what's happening in the classroom when we provide wraparound services and supports to community members and to students and families, that that is also connected to expanded learning opportunities and expanded learning resources ex uh, available to families and to students. And so it's very important that when we think through the work of community schools that we are thinking about connections making connections because that's how we move academic achievement forward and that's how we make sure we have a thriving community. I want to go into the next slide where we talk a little bit about how schools are identified through the blueprint for community schools funding and the different types of funding sources that are available to community schools. As I shared earlier, the identification of community schools is based on MSDE data. We really receive the list of schools from MSDE annually with the state aid formula. And so that does not come out to us until late January, sometimes early February by the time they finalize things. Some things aren't always as final as we would like them. And then there is phase in eligibility. And so what you will see listed on this slide are the phases of eligibility for two grants. The first grant is the grant for personnel funding. That grant has to be used for a must. We do not have an option. We must use that grant for a community school facilitator and a healthcare practitioner. Um, we use any additional remaining funding in that grant for additional wraparound urgent services. Sometimes it may be a food pantry, it could be a, cloak, a coat closet, or any other basic needs that families and students might, might have. In the first year of community schools, we started with only schools that had a three-year poverty average of 80% or higher. You will see as we move into fiscal year 25, that three-year poverty average has decreased to 55%, which is why we have added so many schools every year for the past five years. 
The second grant that you see listed there is the per pupil grant. The per pupil grant also is released in phases. Eligibility for the per pupil grant adjusts not just every year by the three year poverty average, but also how much of the per pupil grant a school receives. So in the first year of a school receiving the per pupil grant, they get 16% of that year's per pupil allocation. Let's say the per pupil allocation is $3,000. Year one, you get 16% of that 3,000. Year two of eligibility, you get 32% of that 3,000. Year three, 37, then 66, then 75. By year five, you have 100% of the per pupil allocation. And so that phase in approach really gives schools time to build the infrastructure and find the partners to execute the programming. Um, funding comes in just like all other state aid funding. It is annual one year. Um, there are some debates at the state level about carryover, and I'm sure we will come back and have more conversations about that. I think um, the one thing that Melissa and I have learned is to extend grace as MSDE tries to navigate um, the legislation and the guidelines around community schools, and so we've created some structures to help us along the way, but we've also been very fluid in making sure we help schools understand how funding should be used. Next slide. Um, last but not least, we wanted to share how we approach community schools because we created this network or neighborhood approach. You'll see our eight networks on the screen. They're really by area. Um, what we didn't want to happen was to have 56 community schools with 56 different programs. And you have a kid at one school that offers one program, but you have a kid that goes to a middle school that's also a community school in the same area, but they have a different program, and you can't benefit from both. So with this network and neighborhood approach, the community school facilitators meet together in what we call network neighborhood meetings, and they share partners, they share resources, they brainstorm the needs of the community at large rather than just their individual schools. So they can be very targeted about what partnerships they form, what programs they build um, that can benefit the entire community. So we don't have a food pantry at 56 schools. That may not be what's needed, but we have a few food pantries in the area that all community members can access rather than just that one school. Um, what you will also see on the screen is a link to our community schools. Um, to kind of wrap us up, you can access that link. It gives you the name of all the schools, the name of the community school facilitator, and where they're at in implementation, whether they're in that year one needs assessment phase, year two implementation planning, whether they're building out a plan and building those infrastructures, or year three full program development. Next, next slide. Yes. Next. <laughs> oh, next one more slide. Well, yeah, a couple more slides. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, the um, Pillar 4 Blueprint allows us to hire system level behavior health coordinators. And as a part of our continuum of services, we, uh, in addition to the community schools, we also provide um, wellness cent centers and provide uh, mental health services, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Under HB 1372, the mental health coordinator has the responsibility, as you'll notice on the sl slide, to support the referral process of services to maximize funding for mental health and provide wraparound services. They support the development of the planning and the delivery of services, and these efforts are accomplished in partnerships with schools through the connection to community resources and referrals to facilitate access. We're going to talk a little bit and share more about our partnerships, which we value tremendously. The maintenance of strong partnerships is vital with the Baltimore County Department of Health and local police department crisis response program who serve in partnership on our mental health advisory council. Behavioral health coordinators are vetted through the Baltimore County government and our local police department assists in supporting the safety and assessment of individuals who may have a behavioral health need as well as our community partners who provide services and supports. Some of those include the National Center for School Mental Health Maryland Center for Safe and Supportive Schools, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and many more agencies and organizations that are important to this work and make sure, again, that we provide that continuum of services for our families and our students. Next slide, please. 
We are very excited in the Division of Schools to um, have the Maryland School-Based Health Center Program, which ensures that school-aged children and youth in Maryland are healthy and ready to learn through an increased access and availability of quality, comprehensive health care. A school-based health center is a clinic located within a school building or on school property that provides comprehensive, primary, acute, and preventive care services to students, families, and community members who enroll in the center. The center's planning grant requires the school to conduct local needs assessments to identify schools that will benefit from new centers. This requires extensive input from our stakeholders as was previously shared, and it identifies the healthcare priorities and the development of an action plan to make quality services available to our families. As you can see on the screen, we have currently five elementary schools, um, four um, wellness centers, at four of our middle schools or accessibility to our middle schools. Dundalk Middle School actually serves, is served by the Dundalk High Wellness Center and Middle River Middle School is by appointment only, but families are able to access that wellness center as well. And then we have seven high schools that we're very proud of that have school wellness-based centers. These centers are supported again at the Baltimore County Department of Health level, but also through our Baltimore County Public Schools Health Services Department. Additional information about our wellness centers and all that we offer in terms of our support services and responsive needs to students can be found um, on our website, especially within the Department of Social Emotional Supports. Next slide, please. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share how we meet the needs of our students. As you can see, we are all very passionate in our different area of work regarding just meeting the total needs of all of our children and making sure that they have everything they need to maintain um, academic and well-being in terms of their progress throughout our school system. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to open up for any questions. Yes, Ms. Hinn. Thank you, Madam Chair. It sound has a nice ring to it. Um, <laughs> thank you for the presentation. This was incredibly informative. Um, this is an area I'm passionate about as well, so I really do appreciate the time and efforts that went into um, preparing this for us tonight, so thank you. Mm -hmm. I have three questions. Um, my first is in the three-year model of implementation. I, first, I appreciate the discipline and the um, a lot of work and thought went into this, clearly. Um, are there um, options to provide for more urgent needs for our students in years one and two, and I believe someone mentioned the coat closet, the food pantry, things of that sort. And would that funding be available then the year or shortly after MSDE identifies a school as being eligible? Absolutely, yes. Um, so when they're doing the beginning need, um, their needs assessment, they start with an asset inventory existing data review and start on those listening sessions and urgent priority needs kind of bubble up, like the food pantry, the care closet. So what we do is we take some of that funding and put it in buckets for them where we know historically those needs have arisen, which is around food access, things like that. So yes, they have the opportunity to begin spending the money pretty quickly once they get it as they identify those urgent needs. Great. And, and that's official as of July 1. Yes. So they may find out about identification in February or March, but um, execution actually starts July 1st. Perfect. Um, and that leads to my, to my second question, which is, does MSDE have the final say in identifying which schools become community schools and then we carry that out? Or does BCPS have any latitude or discretion in determining that? So MSCE identifies schools eligible to be a community school for the personnel grant. But it doesn't just take a grant to do the work. We have encouraged some schools to even think about other funding sources, other grants. Um, through Maryland Leeds, we actually added BC, BCPS Community School, which was Chesapeake High School, and then they wound up becoming an MSDE eligible school. So we no longer needed to fund that through Leeds. And so um, we just think we're so passionate about the initiative that even without the funding, um, there are possibilities to actually get in, dig in and do some of that work. Terrific. And my final question is, do we consider feeder patterns when we're looking at prioritization of community schools? And by that, I mean if students come from an elementary and middle that were community schools, but go on to a high school that has not yet become a community school, how are we meeting their needs? And do we consider that? Um, feeder high school when we are prioritizing supports? 
So that is kind of why we created that network and neighborhood approach. So we could still, those families and those students at those high schools could still access the supports because their elementary or middle school was a community school. So we can't give them that identification, but they would still have access to all the resources and programs at their other schools. Perfect, so they can return to those Absolutely, schools and still receive the same programs and services. Yes, Great, thank you very much. They definitely do, yeah. Oh, yes, they do. Thanks, Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I am a big believer in community schools. I've seen them work uh, when they're done well, and I appreciate all the enthusiasm that is evident in the room for community schools. I have 10 community schools in my district. Mm -hmm. Yay. So <laughs> I uh, am uh, highly invested in not only their success, but the success, success of community schools. Uh, broadly. I wanted to know, uh, I have three schools in needs assessment, five in plan development, and two in implementation. For those schools that are just starting out in needs assessment, what, I know the outreach is surveys and, you know, that kind of thing, letters home. Is there any information on how much of the community is participating and the the level of equity and inclusion and diversity in that participation for the schools and what is it that the public in general because I don't hear about you know the community schools planning but ideally a well-functioning community school is there for me as a member of the community who may not have a child in BCPS so what does that broader outreach look like excellent do you want to take the the one on the needs assessment We're very very um particular about the data that's collected yeah. so the needs collected. assessment when we do our training we are very transparent that it needs to be equitable and it needs to be representative of your school and your individual schools so we give a sample size number but we say although you may reach that number if your data is not showing that you're equitable in who you're speaking to based off your population and your demographic, you may need to surpass that number. Um, so we are very intentional about the needs assessment process and, and what they look at. Um, in terms of how you can access some of the data from that needs assessment, we do have the survey data accessible through a dashboard that we can share after this meeting that's accessible to anyone to see how many stakeholders from each category have responded to that data. Great, thank you. And we're working on marketing strategies with our community school facilitators to make sure that the full community knows what's accessible at the public school or even what resources are accessible within the community supported through community schools. Um, a lot of our community school facilitators have organized events that were open up to lots and lots and lots of um, family members across the entire community. But then they've also partnered with Baltimore City because we do share and swap students all the time. And so we wanna make sure that those supports are consistent across. And some of the strategies that Baltimore City uses to um, share their community school initi initiative in their communities, we have adopted because it's best practice and it's been working for them and so we've been picking that up. So we, I, I'm saddened to hear that it's not um, as vocal in your community, but I hope that changes tomorrow. <laughs> uh, me as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have, yes, tomorrow. I have uh, just a couple of follow-up questions. One is uh, community schools right now are based on concentration of poverty grants, and I see you're connected to the health department and the police department. And are you connected with the local department of social services? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, we recently had um, some situations with students' access to SNAP benefits um, and Medicaid, and we work very closely with the Department of Social Services on that. We communicate pretty frequently with them. They share flyers with us. We push those flyers out to our community school facilitators to make sure it gets out into the community, and then they're even at some of the events that schools have. So we, we've made sure we've been really um, um, particular about how we are partnering, not just with them, but with other Baltimore County agencies outside of BCPS. Great, thank you. And last question. Uh, community schools, as you said, can be any school. And I know that we're identifying schools by concentration of poverty at this point. There was a school in my district, Maiden Choice, that was initially identified as a community school. And then uh, I don't, the, that identification was removed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I am 
that's interesting to me because that population of those students are uh, a vulnerable population, a special needs population, which means their families have probably uh, decidedly more uh, complicated uh, issues to navigate on top of uh, whatever the poverty level may or may not be. And so has there been any thought to implementing uh, main choice as a community school outside of the uh, concentration of poverty grant? I think it's definitely worth a conversation. What I'm hoping to be able to say as we project is that they will re-enter, but um, the truth is that we don't have any firm information about that because calculation methods really are left up to MSDE and they have a very um, unique and complex calculation process um, that actually adjusted between January and February of 2023. And so that's what caused that drop of made in choice in other schools. But um, we have been talking about other ways in which we can help schools that are interested in the initiative to be able to have access to doing some of the community school work. So we, we're in the works of working on that. Thank you, thank you very much for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, thank you, we appreciate you. Any other, go ahead, Ms. Pumphrey. Most of my questions were already answered, but um, if you could provide some clarification as far as the MSDE calculation, because you mentioned that some schools who aren't designated, maybe I'm misunderstanding, um, you specifically in one school um, was offered a Leeds grant in order to be a community school. Do they still have to be designated by MSDE, but they don't receive the personnel grant through MSDE? Can you um, clarify that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Chesapeake High School is the school that we elected to add through Maryland Leeds as a community school before they were identified by MSDE. And we did that because almost every elementary and middle school that fed into Chesapeake High School was already a community school. And so we really wanted to get a head start on making sure that that school built a model that they could sustain once they were identified. The calculation method, though, that I mentioned about Maiden Choice being an example of that, um, actually is something that happened only once last school year. Um, a list came out in January, and then um, things were recalculated, and a new list came out in February, and it adjusted the schools. We are very hopeful that the calculation method that was revised is the one that will be sustained when schools are identified in this upcoming year. Um, but again, we have learned our lesson and we are being very <laughs> cautious in making sure that we have final information before we let schools know. But we have let schools know we are projecting you may be a community school, so get ready. And when we say go, you may go. Um, but we won't say go until we're absolutely sure. So. And just one more question. You mentioned the quick growth, especially for next year. Yes. Um, do you, are you foreseeing any difficulty with implementation because of the quick growth in additional schools? Um, actually, we don't because we've already met with the projected principals to give them some insight. They can start to learn about community schools. We're scheduling a time for them to visit some high-quality community schools in the district and even in surrounding counties. And we're looking at sending them to the community school conference so they can learn about commun effective community schools nationally. That at least will build capacity and understanding what it means to be a community school versus what they are right now. Um, and even if they aren't identified by the state, there may be some great strategies that they pick up from those opportunities that they can implement. I lied, one more question. Okay. <laughs> so um, you mentioned effective community schools. So for some of our schools, community schools that aren't quite as effective, um, what steps are we taking to improve to make sure that they become more effective community schools? So we are redesigning our support model to make sure that schools that are um, still doing some tedious work to get to where they need to be in implementing the community school initiative have the support that they need. The current model we have has worked thus far for as much as it can do. It is time for us to revisit and reevaluate, and that's what we're doing, and we're making adjustments. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I have a few. Okay. So, <laughs> and so I want to go back to this calculation by MSDE. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so we are proactively predicting. We are running those calculations and coming up having a list of the schools um, 
ourselves from the calculations that they put out publicly to say this is what the calculations will be. The method, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then when that when they change it, are we at the table with MSDE? Do we have anyone from Baltimore County at the table when these when these decisions are being made in any work groups or, or anything like that? Um, I know that my fiscal friends aren't here, <laughs> and the release of um, the list of schools comes through the state aid formula document, um, but I know that they have been very vocal, not just Baltimore County, but every single county pretty much was in an uproar last February when this occurred. I don't know if Dr. Rogers has more to add, but. Yes, I would concur with your assertions here. Um, additionally, uh, you know, this, this board, uh, you'll remember, the the massive changes in terms of uh, budget, you know, that that came out last year, uh, millions in terms of shift as a result of recalculation. So uh, all school systems are looking very closely. We're all uh, in support of sending out the correct information the first time. Uh, we're doing our um, due diligence, you know, to try to predict. Um, and hoping that the methodology that we're using aligns with the methodology uh, that they're using, but also using um, lessons learned from last year as we work with our uh, principals. Um, you know, as, as Ms. Stansberry said, get ready on your mark, <laughs> but then when we know for sure, then you can go. But, but definitely the frustration was felt widespread. But you know, when you have a certain percentage of your budget that comes from state funding, um, you are, you know, you, you have to comply with the information that they provide. Yep. And if we ever don't want to comply, um, <laughs> I'm just saying we can get together as a board and discuss and um, and take some action because it's it, that wasn't fair to, to school systems, to schools. And I just I don't want to see a repeat of that this year. But I am hopeful um, with with what's happening. But I just encourage any meeting that we can attend any well, that, you know, make sure we're there. Um, the other question I have is regarding the roadmap. So I noticed in that roadmap you have a lot of um, really good information in each of the, the buckets. Mm -hmm. And so there's metrics behind each of everything in that roadmap that you're um, monitoring. Mm -hmm. And I love that you have an external evaluator. Who's the external evaluator? Johns Hopkins. Johns Hopkins. And um, how often are they shared? Oh, oh sorry, just you. you just approved the contract for that earlier uh, this school year. <laughs> that was a good choice. Okay. So, um, <laughs> um, how often will they provide reports? Annually. Annually. Yep. Um, they are a new evaluator. We had a different evaluator prior to this, and as I shared, we're in year five, so we reevaluated things and realized that we need to move in a different direction. Um, our hope is that they come in and take a look at our roadmap and give us some advice about data collection methods, whether we're collecting the right metrics, and then you may see revisions to the roadmap ba based on their feedback. But they will give us um, some output data for this year and then make recommendations for improvements next year. And then with the community schools, um, what are some examples of things that are happening during the summer to engage students in learning and enrichment experiences during these, um, with these community schools? Um, so we have a lot, we call it out of school time programming. Um, we have a lot of out of school time program, current programming happening, whether that be through mentoring services, academic enrichment opportunities. We have, um, we're utilizing a lot of the board contracted vendors to provide some of those out of school time programming opportunities. Um, and then there's a lot of small businesses that are also doing that at individual schools and in centralized locations. And you're collecting um, data on like, are, are the students showing up to those we are collecting data on that. That's part of their um, the metrics that we gather from them. What is the participation data? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Any final questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Our the next item on the agenda is an information item including um, the minutes from the October Southeast East Area Education Advisory Council meeting. And then the next item on the agenda is board member comments and agenda set and, and agenda setting. So I will go around and I will start. I'm going to switch it up this time. Um, I'm going to start with Ms. Lichter. 
Um, I do not have any um, comments or agenda setting. Okay. Mr. McMillian? Neither do I. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Savoy? Not at this time, thank you. Ms. Harvey? Uh, I have no agenda items. I'd just like to wish everybody a, a warm and safe holiday season, however you choose to celebrate, whether Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or all of the above. Uh, please do celebrate, take care, spend time with your families. Ms. Drummond? I have nothing. Okay. And Ms. Hinn? Thank you. I just want to say congratulations again to our new board officers, um, Ms. Booker Dwyer, Ms. Pumphrey. Congratulations, and also thank you to Vice Chair Harvey and Chair Lichter for your leadership over the past year. Have a good evening, everyone. Ms. Dulesky. Thank you. Um, the stakeholder feedback for the budget process, I think, was really informative, and I hope that as we continue to approve the budget, we focus on the teacher-student ratio and the teacher retention. Those were two things that really seemed to jump out as important. Thank you. Ms. Frimpong. Happy holidays. Mr. Young? I have nothing, thank you. And Ms. Dominowski? I didn't have anything, but I want to say thank you for switching it up and have a great <laughs> night. <laughs> and Ms. Pumphrey? I just want to say thank you to our former chair and vice chair. What a wonderful job you've done this past year. And I was hopeful at the beginning of yet last year, and I'm hopeful again. I know that we work well together as a board, and I'm looking forward to this next year. Thank you. Yes, and, and thank you. I want to echo Ms. Pumphrey's comments um, to thank our, our uh, former chair and vice chair. You all did a wonderful job at um, leading us through some really bumpy times, and so hopefully you have smoothed the road out for us, and it'll just be smooth sailing from here. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to, to this next phase of leadership and working closely with all of you. So the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next board meeting will be held Tuesday, December 19th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.